When it comes to the art of sudden scene cuts for comedic effect, Brooklyn Nine-Nine is rarely, if ever, found lacking. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 Brooklyn Nine-Nine cutaways. We get to field test a bunch of cool new weapons, and there's always a new training situation. Last year's was Prison Break. It got super violent. It's like being in an action movie. For this list, we're looking at what we feel are the funniest and most clever of the show's cutaway gags. Those jokes in which a described situation is briefly shown before abruptly returning to the ongoing plot. Sometimes it's a matter of the length of the gag, other times it's the visual payoff to an earlier setup. Regardless, the end result is we're left laughing. Please be aware that, as this involves explaining the context and payoff of certain jokes, spoilers will be present. Number 10. While Jake Was Gone It's easy to think that, in the time between seasons when Detective Jake Peralta is undercover, some serious hijinks would ensue at the 9-9. Alright, fill me in. Tell me everything I missed. However, this ended up not being the case, as the episode Undercover quickly makes clear. While Jake seeks to get caught up on the events that transpired at the precinct since his departure, Rosa begins to inform him of the few noteworthy events that occurred. It won't take long, only three things happened. Terry chipped his tooth and had a lisp for a week. Listen up, Steven. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I say something amusing to you? What we're shown in a trio of quick cuts is less hysterical madness and more of a string of mildly odd occurrences. What it lacks in drama, though, the scene makes up for in fun sight gags, such as the reason for headphones being banned. Great recap. Number 9. The Wooden Duck I would be happy to assist you if you will just admit, Raymond, that you threw my decoy in the garbage. That will never happen, because it's not true. Thank you for nothing. Good day. One of Captain Raymond Holt's most interesting qualities is a deep-rooted pettiness when it comes to those he feels have wronged him an inability to let go of grudges and ill will. It also tends to come up at the most inconvenient times, such as when Jake asked his assistance in finding an OBGYN for Terry Jeffords' pregnant wife, Sharon. I'd be happy to help. Great. We need a doctor here immediately. We have to get your ex-boyfriend. I will not help you. Jake and a reluctant Holt go to visit one of Holt's ex-boyfriends, Frederick, who was sore about Holt supposedly throwing a prized wooden duck in the trash out of jealousy. As it turns out, though, the reality is both more extreme and more amusingly basic. Holt actually pushed the duck off a bridge because he didn't like its beak. I didn't throw the duck in the garbage. I threw it off a bridge. Number 8. Too Much Information Charles Boyle sure loves to chat, more than is reasonable. Every time you talk, I hear that sound that plays when Pac-Man dies. That's part of why it's amusing to witness Gina desperately try to keep their budding affair under wraps. Charles, I'm concerned that you're going to tell Jake about the incident. <laughs> Knowing how much Boyle likes to confide in Jake about his most unsettling or just plain weird stories, Gina makes clear how imperative Boyle's silence is once Jake has returned from undercover work. Unfortunately, we're immediately given evidence via cutaway that this will be quite the unique struggle for Boyle. He really just doesn't seem to have any restraint when it comes to sharing. Jake's back and you tell him everything. No, I don't. I got aroused last night watching a nature documentary on bees. I was fine until they went inside the hive. Frankly, we'd like to forget learning that much about Boyle's attractions. Number 7. Holt's Freakout It's not like we're college professors calling ourselves doctors. It's not the same thing, my friend. Kids don't ever disrespect etymology. At the very least, it seems unwise to do so in front of one Raymond Holt, ever the stickler for clearly defined rules and principles. During the events of The Box, in which Captain Holt and Jake seek to get a confession from suspected murderer Philip Davidson, Davidson's credentials as a dentist are brought up. Doctor. It's funny when people call dentists doctor. We are doctors. Initially, it seems like a case of Holt simply nitpicking the notion of dentists being comparable to doctors. But then he keeps getting more exasperated and indignant. When someone has a heart attack on a plane, do they yell out, yo, does anybody here have an art history PhD? A PhD is a doctorate. Cutting out just as Holt's ranting seems to be reaching a fever pitch, the scene's implications and the subsequent cooldown leave quite an impression. Okay, Captain. Now, I know we live in a world where anything can mean anything, and nobody even cares about etymology. <sighs> apparently, that's a trigger for me. Yeah, apparently. Number six, Holt and the Soup. Interesting. Very, very interesting. It might not be the best use of a detective's time, but it sure is a fun turn of events. 
During the cold open to Beach House, an eagle-eyed Jake notes Gina walking off with a plastic bag and can only draw one conclusion, a very pantsless Captain Holt. Here are the facts. At 11.55 a.m., Captain Holt walked past us holding a hot bowl of soup. At 12.03 p.m., I heard him yell, Ouch! We're then treated to a rundown of further evidence backing up Jake's claim before he sets about his new mission of proving the captain's predicament. Jake's determination, however, quickly outpaces his common sense as he ultimately makes the same mistake Holt did. Good thing Holt's desk is big enough for two. Look at us! Just three people with pants on having a normal conversation. Yep, no story here. Number five, the Santiago drunkenness scale. But I've never seen six drink Amy. Maybe she's the one I could actually be friends with, AKA my Sasquatch. Absurd as the notion of drunk personas may be, it still grants characters license to go wild with unusual yet entertaining behavior. So it goes with Amy Santiago's escalating misadventures when inebriated, a concept introduced by Gina as she and other 99 folks prepare for a beach house excursion. Gina's sardonic descriptions of the various drunk levels, as conveyed by the ever witty Chelsea Peretti, are endearing in themselves. Three drinks, Amy dance pants. Four drink, Amy is a bit of a pervert. Hey, check it out. Yet it's the visual cuts to Melissa Fumero's Amy acting out overly enthusiastic flirtation, aggressive overconfidence, and other intense emotional states that make this magnificent comedy work. Five drink Amy is weirdly confident. Let's do this, little man. Number four, bad secondary. Hey Boyle, I know you haven't had Peralta as a secondary in a while. Be careful, it can be rough. What a strange way to incur property damage while on the job. One might raise an eyebrow when Amy warns Boyle about working a case with Jake as a secondary. After all, Jake and Boyle's friendship is legendary. Of course, it's quickly revealed why she harbors a certain lingering weariness. Jake's not exactly good at hanging back and acting in a support role. Actually, that's putting it lightly. Jake has the death of a poor defenseless one-way mirror on his hands because of his need for control. So you were just borrowing those cars? Ask him about his bank account. Ask him about his bank account. Ask him about his bank Besides being a fun aside, it also handily sets up the conflict for the rest of the episode. Number three, the pinata incident. Central to Terry's personal growth in the first season is dealing with lingering tension and stress from the so-called mannequin incident. Sir, I haven't fired a weapon since the incident. The mannequin incident. I'm familiar. <laughs> That's not the only incident taunting Terry, though, as becomes apparent when Captain Holt seeks Terry's assistance at a shooting range. Via flashback, we're shown that Terry freaking out and firing blindly at a target was not an isolated issue. What makes this potentially unsettling moment funny lies both in Terry's over-the-top shrieking and in how Jake reacts to the slain pinata. Another incident? You gotta cool it, man. I'm gonna get some candy. Honestly, we'd probably be no different. Number two, Scary Terry. Hey Sarge, I need someone to fill out a lineup. Will you be Scary Terry? Sometimes it's the little things in comedy. What glimpses we get of Terry's life and interests beyond the 99 suggest how comically mundane yet seemingly earnest the man truly is. This is perhaps best showcased with the persona of Scary Terry, a character Terry portrays on occasion when the 99 needs to fill out a lineup. Though only shown briefly, as part of a request made by Charles Boyle, it's still enough to grasp Scary Terry's nature. Plus, it's fun to imagine how much Terry wants to embrace being blunt, angry, and very openly passionate about local produce. This is taking too long! I'm gonna miss the farmer's market! Before we unveil our most hilarious number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. What made you decide to tell us now? Charles found out on the road trip, and I was positive he was not going to be able to keep the secret for much longer. Bye, Rosa. I mean, not bye, but bye. I mean, see ya. I mean, have fun only having sex with men, just banging dudes left and right. I just stopped saying bye altogether. Ever since we've been down here, you've been a little depressed. Have I? <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't eat the burrito. Oh, I'm disgusting. Damn, Rosa! How did you do that? I have a dark past.
Now you know my deepest shame. I said you two need a bone. How dare you, Detective Diaz? I am your superior officer! Bone! What happens in my bedroom, Detective, is none of your business. Bone! Don't ever speak to me like that again. Officer Deepmore helped me out with my crime scene, so I gave him a little thank you present. Hey, Deepmore, if you're gonna bag evidence like a five-year-old, you should have the proper tools. It's in my first police kit. The walkie-talkie blows bubbles. Hope you can handle it. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Annoyance by Guitar Let it never be said that Jake lacks follow-through for ideas he believes in. By rushing to arrest suspected jewelry thief Dustin Whitman, played by guest star Kid Cudi, Jake puts the 9-9 in the position of having to definitively prove the man's guilt within two days. What evidence did you have when you arrested this guy? Some pretty ironclad stuff. Dustin, it's been a while. Mind if I ask you a few questions? Well, well, well. If it isn't Joe Peralta, <laughs> that's it, you're under arrest! Case closed. After spinning their wheels with a bunch of dead ends, Amy suggests irritating the suspect into talking, and Jake shows how desperate he is by trying out the idea in earnest. Two, three, four. Jake's deliberately abysmal guitar solo is amusing in itself, but his reaction to the lackluster result really brings the moment home. Didn't work. Q did not work. What's even better is seeing the same tactic used four seasons later in a similar interrogation scene. Like we said, the man has follow through. I just had an idea. Two, three, four. Yeah, I really gotta stop trying that, it never works. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Watch Mojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.